So as you've heard me talk about this morning, um, I spent a fair bit of time in Christchurch after the earthquakes and the uh, minister in charge down there was a guy called Jerry Brownlee and um, we just used to refer to him as the boss and I'd like to say good morning, Jerry. Hello. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. And, and you? you? And happy birthday for the other day too. Thank you. And how are you... Um, and how are you in Christchurch or are you in Wellington? No, I'm in Christchurch. Right. So, Jerry. The Parliament did this week. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, it stopped, didn't it? They put the kibosh on it. Yeah, and I think that was probably the right thing to do. You need all ministers, particularly uh, all ministers, in fact, to be focused on how they help people in this pretty awful circumstance. Yeah, and you are the one person in this country who understands what it like, it's like to be dealing, or not one person, but you certainly have some amazing insights into what it's like to be leading um, the response effort uh, to a situation like we're facing on the East Coast. So just what's your, what's your take on where we're at at the moment and what's happened? Well, I think um, what's happening at the moment is, is as you would expect, uh, and it's quite appropriate. So... You know, you've got the um, immediate sort of concerns about people's welfare, et cetera, uh, that are, you know, being dealt with. You never get it totally right. I certainly haven't made too many comments because I know what it's like when you're trying to put all these things together and you get people screaming in your ear about why isn't this there, why isn't that there. Well, you know, you're doing your best to make it happen, but um, uh, you can't just magic it up out of, out of nowhere. So I think um, what they're doing at the moment, uh, particularly the, the emergency management people and our first responders, fantastic work and very necessary for probably at least another week or so yet. Uh, but beyond that, we hope that there's a whole lot of consideration and thought going into how you recover from this. Because it won't be easy and it won't be fast uh, and uh, it's going to take a, a, a large amount of money as well. Yeah, because I talked to Robert McCulloch about that this morning. He's an economist out of Auckland. And um, we did talk about that at that forward planning phase, intelligence and planning, I think they call it, or intelligence. I don't know. It's got, probably got another moniker in, in the emergency set up these days. But um, it's that's, that, that stuff has to be started now too, doesn't it? It does. And I think uh, while, you know, the emergency management have some role, uh, particularly under the, the changes that we made to the law where you go from a state of emergency into a recovery period, uh, that's not going to be enough. And it's, it does have to be led from uh, ministers who've got responsibility for transport, for communications, uh, for housing, for uh, the, the welfare for people that need that, and uh, health, everything, you, you name it. It's uh, got to be right up there. And that's why I think eventually they're going to have some kind of um, uh, a body that will, will pull it all together. Uh, it is unlikely to be sort of, in my opinion, left to individual ministers. It'll, it'll, it'll be a, a way in which they can collaborate to get things done. Yeah, now the, my problem with that is, is we saw, I think, through the pandemic that there was a lot of people in the business community who said, "Hey, look, we tried to help," and these like these were the boys in the you know the top fifty, uh, and 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 they tried to get involved and help the government through some of those things like MIQ and 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 all of that, and they sort of got shut out. Um, and and I, I suppose, and Robert and I talked about this too. It's wh how do you stitch together, and what would it actually look like? Is is this an infrastructure thing, or is it much wider than that? I, I think it's uh, predominantly going to end up being infrastructure. That's no disrespect for people who've lost their homes and their uh, orchards and other businesses, etc. Um, but to get to get all those back again, you need that infrastructure. You need your communications. You need the the roading network and and uh, anything else that goes with that. Your, your basic services, free waters, etc. Um, and uh, to to say that. Uh, you, you, the government can do it all on its own. I think it's completely wrong. Um, remember that uh, one of the saving graces in Christchurch was the fact that people were so well uh, insured. Now, the question will be, in this particular case, how far that insurance goes. But you've got to work with those uh, insurers through the insurance council because it's a big chunk of uh, resource that's necessary. And then you've got to do the work that's needed to make sure that where people can make choices themselves, uh, that they're able to get work done. Uh, that's, that seems to be a, a growing concern at the moment. Yeah. So look, there's, there's going to be massive consideration over the next uh, few weeks. From a National Party point of view, we've said, well, look, we, 
want to cooperate any way we can to try and get a good result for people. Mm. But we will be looking for uh, the government to, to take some decisive leads. Uh, and as you know, indecision is one of the worst things you can get in these circumstances. Yeah, I remember uh, you telling me that one day, just make a decision. It might not be wrong one, we'll sort it out afterwards, but make a decision. I always live by that down in Christchurch and yeah, it didn't get yeah, me into too much trouble. <laughs> For the, for the greater part, it worked. For yep. the greater part, it worked. And you'll always get um, you know, people who are upset about this or that. Yep. Uh, that's natural, and I accept that. But for the vast majority of people, um, making a decision uh, relatively quickly gave them a, a bit of an opportunity to have at least some, uh, some further choice in their life. Yeah. And the other thing which prob- a lot of people probably wouldn't know is behind the scenes, you were very, very concerned about making sure the communities were st- stitched together and I was tasked with doing like pop-ups um, all around Christchurch to bring communities together with a barbecue and some candy floss and a bit of music so they could sit down and, and I always remember the first one that we did um, and people came and they were sort of almost frightened and then they got there and they sat down they couldn't quite believe they were sort of doing something normal and amongst all the chaos and, and that was your idea that was that was, and I'm hoping we're see, seeing a wee bit of it in Tanui this weekend. So they're they're having like a picnic um, in Tanui because it's a little community, but they've been stricken um, with what's happened. And uh, are you hopeful that there is enough sort of understanding of some of those community principles for that to be rolled out in this? I do hope so because everyone who's been through this has a shared experience that'll be a little bit different to the the next person they talk to. But uh, the common threads are very clear. And I think the need for people to uh, get together in as normalised a circumstance as possible uh, and to talk with one another is extremely important. Um, You know, we we also had, uh, you'll remember uh, Sir Peter Gluckman, the chief scientist at the time, look at the, do a bit of analysis internationally on what we could expect uh, from, you know, mental health and well-being. Mm. And it was very clear that uh, giving people the opportunity to be together uh, was a significant first step in making sure that you didn't have uh, communities that were were too um, dislocated or... or, um, you know, remote. You didn't have people mm. just going down their bunker, sort of deeply. Um, you know, I suppose you'd say. You know, I'll use the word depressed about the circumstances. Yep. Uh, they need to be able to see light above the horizon. They need to know that they're not on it on their own. Yeah, and that's why those events are so very important. That's right. And there was two communities that stood out in Christchurch, and one of them was Sumner, and the other one was Littleton, and they were very, very collectively together, um, and and um, and rolled out all of that stuff better than anyone else. I could never quite work out what it was that made them superior in terms of dealing with it, but they did. And they were just like best in show for keeping their communities collectively together. Yeah, I think because they're uh, geographically defined suburbs and um, that that certainly helped them. They've they've always had um, that sense of identity. Uh, There are numerous places around New Zealand like that. The interesting thing is with this particular disaster where it's you know, affected communities from North Cape right down to well south of East Cape um, in, in quite a broad uh, swathe through there. Lots and lots of uh, small communities who I hope will be able to do that. Mm, yeah. Now, the other big gnarly question is, is, is EQC got enough in the tank to cover this? Uh, that's a question that I don't have an answer to. But remember that EQC is uh, 100% backed by the government. Right, so they'll find the money no no matter what? Well, the question is, uh, yeah, so they'll they'll meet the obligation. The question is, uh, how does the government fund it? Yeah. And that's uh, that's something that um, uh, we'll certainly have to look at Mm. moving forward. At the moment, you know, you just had one more death declared today. Yeah. Um, uh, Numerous people still missing. Yes. It's a horrible situation out there, and um, I think just all support for those who are out there doing the hard work on the ground. Thank goodness that the weather's a bit better uh, yep. and it's warm enough. If it had been winter, it would have been a very miserable time for too many people. Yeah, yeah. And and this is, you know, we talked about the planning approach, but, you know, the infrastructure deficit on the East Coast is, I, I, I've got a feeling it's going to be not dissimilar to Christchurch when it's all wrapped up. And you've also got the legacy stuff from the last 
flooding in, in Auckland and, and lumped that all together. And we, my gut feel is we've probably got a disaster in the same magnitude of Christchurch, if not possibly bigger. Uh, look, I think it's shaping up that way. I mean, if you just look at uh, down here, we had 14,000 people displaced from their homes. Yep. Um, you know, 180,000 homes that were, were damaged to some extent, but 14,000 displaced, and you, you've already got 10,000 uh, mm. through this disaster. So yeah, it's heading, heading in a similar direction, and it'll require a similar response. And on the infrastructure, it's tough, you know, just that earthquake uh, in Pakura that uh, really ripped up the um, State Highway 1, uh, really from about Cheviot right through to, um, um, you know, probably Kikaringu, somewhere around there. That was closed, uh, you know, for two years. Um, so, you know, it's not an easy thing to fix that. Um, so it has to be very well planned, well executed, and there does have to be temporary solutions uh, so that communities aren't uh, isolated. And isn't it, it, it's really quite distressing that in this day and age, we've got communities um, up on the East Coast who are still four days after the three days after the event, um, Isolated. I know. Uh, you it's know, crazy. I, don't, I just don't get that. No. Um, and and that, that's a that's a multi generational failing. It's not not pointing the finger in any direction at all. I think something that we we can't allow to happen again in the future. Yeah, and the rethink I think around where we put houses. And Larissa, who's in the studio with me, who's a refugee from um, Hawke's Bay. Kia ora. Um, she, you know, she talked about the suburb that's along the waterfront in Napier. Tiawanga, is it? Tiawa. Tiawa. Yes. Which, I, the last time I was up there, I looked at it and I thought, wow, why would you build there? Yeah, it's yes. obviously wetlands. Yeah. It's low lying. We keep, we've, kept, we've, we've, got the, we've got this problem in Masterton as well. We're going to have to have a real big rethink, I think, about where we put houses. Yeah, that's, you know, um, one of the things that struck me uh, from some of the engineers who were doing the uh, land assessments post Christchurch was the suggestion that in New Zealand you live with your risk. Uh, we've got it all. Every type of natural disaster that you could possibly beset someone uh, or, or a community, uh, we're subject to it. So right from volcano, uh, uh, what's it called, earthquake, and then, of course, tsunami and any, mm. anything else in between. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got to be very careful about those sorts of things. Yeah. The, the, the flip side is, and this, this sounds like I'm, I'm being a little bit um, uh, you know, less than sympathetic, but we, we've, you can go for, you know, 100 or more years and have nothing happen, mm. uh, and then you have that one and a half or one and 250-year event, as this one has been called. Um, so you've got to – there is a degree of sort of thinking it through uh, you know, and understanding risk a bit better than uh, than we currently. So you don't see this as a climate change issue? That's like we're going to see more and more of these events. Uh, look, I can't comment on that. I'm not, not up with that science. But what I do know is that um, generally, weather has become far more entertaining for people than uh, than it was when I was much younger. Yeah, I'd have um, to admit we're all weather I'll, watchers, aren't we? Now? I'll, I'll, I'll say it like that, not from not the point of view that. Um, uh, not from any sort of uh, uh, flippant point of view. It's just that we we all do, as you say, watch the weather a lot more. Yeah. Um, and and then you get the you know the events that appear to be sort of uh, you know piling up on top of each other. Mm. But then you know I look back and the, the Coromandel, for example, has I, I think just about every Christmas season, Christmas New Year season. Uh, you know, for every few, had sort of flooding events and other such. So, it, you know, there's, there are patterns there that perhaps are being sped up. I don't know, but yeah. um, it's. I think Gisborne's in that entirely... camp too, isn't it? I mean, the East Cape is just a—it's a basket case. It's been the fifth or sixth time they've had emergency responses in less than a year. Yeah, and in that case, I mean, I think you've got to say something's going on. So, uh, let's let's have a really good look at how you make those uh, uh, facilities uh, more, I'm going to use the word, I hate using the word resilient, um, you know, uh, buildings and um, uh, physical assets can be resilient, people are not. I get really yeah. wild when people say, oh, they're, we're a resilient community. You're not. You've, um, you're a fragile community and, and accept it and, and deal with it and work it on that basis, but make your, your infrastructure resilient so it can mm. step stuff and bounce back and, yep. and uh, be useful again. It's pretty old, the old Maslow hierarchy of needs, isn't it, really? Um, you need a good house and you need a good feed. 
um, is the two top things, and that's pretty much where we should be looking at. Um, Jerry, just in terms of, um, there's been a text come through, and someone has, has asked this question: If you uh, do, you think that this special legislation could be required to support a holistic government approach? And does he think that this government will draw on a comprehensive, a comprehensive lessons and legacy work done near the end of Sarah? Oh well, I certainly hope so. I mean, um, uh, w- one thing that was very useful. Uh, for Christchurch was the Recovery Act, uh, 100% supported by Parliament, unanimous support. Uh, and it, it gave a basis for being able to do things and get things done. It was it was it had a sunset on it, um, which I think is appropriate, uh, but it gave a number of years where there was a, a plan to be executed and it, and it has been, and it's been largely successful. A uh, similar approach was taken with uh, the Kaikoura earthquake uh, where you know there was absolutely no way that you you could go through the normal RMA process uh, and expect to get uh, you know consents in a timely fashion to mm. uh, get open a road that needed to be open. Uh, and look, the circumstances that we're facing now would tell me that that would be the smart thing to do because it, it's just stuff you've just got to do. And yes, it's all got to be done lawfully, so make it lawful. Um, just make the one comment. I think Siri got a bit of a a bad rap, largely from uh, opposition at the time, who are now the current government. And I think they will be having a wee bit of a look at and saying, well, you know, perhaps we were a little bit ahead of ourselves there. Yeah. Because the, that organisation did great work. And yeah. um, yep. uh, interestingly, nothing that it uh, put in place has been undone in the last, uh, you know, five years by the current government. So Mm. those, all I'm, I'm not really, I'm trying not to be too political, but all I'm saying is that when you've got to get a job done, uh, create the circumstances that allow people to do it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, and, and just just on a, another note too, I noticed there's a story in the paper this morning of the Christchurch City Council having a, a whack at the Three Waters legislation and wanting to pull stormwater out. Um, and a very, I think they've presented a very um, cogent case around why it should be. And one of the justifications for them wanting it out is you're going to have a lot of trouble managing flood problems um, within the framework of Three Waters. Is that how you see it? Oh, it's certainly one of the many problems with uh, Three Waters. And uh, what I really find irritating is that there are people sort of saying, oh, we need and now need Three Waters because look at all this flood stuff. Yeah. Well, um, I <laughs> no. don't think that's a reasonable position at all. Uh, there's a multiple sort of uh, multi um, uh, facet of, uh, of not, um, sorry, a multiple of reasons why we, we've had the uh, effects, not the least of which enormous amount of uh, uh, rain that fell on the, on the uh, areas affected. So, uh, look, Three Waters is a messy, messy um, proposal from the government. I think that what sits behind it is probably not exactly the purest reason for, for going ahead with all this. And so I hope that in the reconsideration, we do start to think these things through a bit better. And, you know, take advice from the local communities who, who know what to do. One of the things that you do find... Uh, it repeatedly is uh, advice being given to councils at various times about taking some sort of action on an infrastructure issue, but then deferring it because of uh, uh, costs. Yep. And so, if costs are the problem, solve the problem of costs, and not the not, but not with a massive bureaucracy that uh, has a you know sort of one size fits all across uh, four entities. Mm, yeah. And the other sort of um, unusual piece of information um, that sort of came to light today, which is something we've been following here on the platform because I raised it as a spectre last week, is the possibility of a snap election. And um, uh, Sean and I teased it out on Monday and uh, Matthew Hooten has a column uh, today saying uh, uh, there would be very, very good reasons for this government to call a snap election. How likely do you think that would be? And what are the benefits and what are the pros and cons on it? Well, what are the reasons? Um, firstly, they're a majority government. Yep. Uh, they don't need to have... Uh, um, th- there's no way that if they want to do something, they can't do it. Um, that's what a majority allows you to do. And uh, the justification, therefore, of a, a, for a snap election is not great. If it was simply that, oh, well, you know, we, we're going to have a little more debt than we expected, well, that's not a reason either. That's, a, that's something for people to make a choice about. Not, not something that you confront people with. And I think uh, there's absolutely no grounds for a, a um, 
snap election at all. And in fact, the distraction of a snap election at a time when you're trying to get people into uh, yeah. uh, uh, into some kind of recovery uh, is just not acceptable. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. It'd be hard-pressed to get anyone on the East Coast or polling booth um, in the next... Well, it's not only that. You, you know what's happened. As soon as you declare an election, mm. uh, the bureaucracy stops. That's right. So, you know, we, we want the bureaucracy... Um, uh, you know, showing itself to be an exemplary performer. At it's the a mad, time. That's a, I've always found that, I mean, I've been in the government off and on over the years, and I always find that really bad that it actually stops. And I mean, I know with Sarah we were lucky because we had the act so we could keep on doing some stuff. Um, but it's, everyone's, every, I'm, I'm involved with a few projects out there, and I'm fascinated by how everyone's like, we're going to get stuff done before June because, you know, then everyone stops and you can't get anything to happen in government. That is not the way it should be. We shouldn't have a government uh, that closes down. No, well, it's the bureaucracy who choose to do that. Yeah, they, um, they've got no right to. Uh, well, they're of an opinion that um, uh, the, the, the mandate from the government uh, ceases at the time that an election is declared. Well, we know oh. that's 14th of October. Yeah. Uh, we know that the uh, regulated period is, is uh, for electoral purposes, is three months before that. But that does not stop. Uh, the machinery of government. It doesn't stop enacting uh, government policy, and government yep. policy comes directly from cabinet decisions. So, yeah, it's a weird thing, and um, uh, right at the moment, it would be a terrible situation for the people on the, um, oh, how on the East Coast, and uh, right up through Auckland and, and uh, uh, Northland. It definitely makes me think that there's a definite need to get that legislation sorted out pretty quick so that they can operate like we did with Sarah. Well, that's, hopefully that's what's uh, on the books, because I think that's mm. what's needed. Yeah. Hey, Jerry, uh, look, um, if there's any other insights you'd like to share, um, more than happy to, um, uh, if you've got any other comments. Uh, no, none that relate to this. I've got lots of comments, as you <laughs> would well know. But um, none that relate to this, and, and certainly not going to share any secrets either. <laughs> Okay. Well, not even to your fruitcake <laughs> recipe. I was very interested in, the, in your recipe for your fruit fruitcake. It's far too complicated. I've seen some of your efforts and they're brilliant, but no, this is a very complicated thing. <laughs> it raised $1,000, wasn't it? It did, yeah. 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 I don't think not I get quite, that uh, Not quite the 100000 for for a, um, a slip of the tongue in the house that was put on a piece of paper. I could still yeah. stack it at that. It's yes, fantastic. same. And, and I thought um, it was well played, Seymour, well played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He did. Hey, look, um, always a delight to talk with um, you, Jerry. Hopefully, in the next few months, we might be able to get together with the, the um, Christchurch crew again and uh, chew, chew the fat over a glass of wine. Um, but hope you enjoy your weekend and thank you very, very much for your insights. No worries. We'll see you later.